terminate every diversity, equity, and inclusion program across the entire federal government. All of our staff that falls under the DEI initiative have been told they're going to be let go at the end of the semester. After you've taken away all of our social organizations and our funding, where else do we have here? Welcome back to our BET News special, What's at Stake? I'm with representatives Maxine Waters, Joyce Beatty, and Jasmine Crockett. In recent years, we've witnessed the push to limit the teaching of black history. The Supreme Court has struck down affirmative action. And now, the push to eliminate diversity, equity, and inclusion programs in higher education and corporate America. Let me start with you, Congresswoman Crockett, the idea of what we're seeing, particularly on college campuses. Uh, you know, we've seen it in corporate America for years, but um, the target, it seems, is higher education, college campus, uh, campuses. We've been really fighting it in the state of Texas. Here's my big frustration. Um, when you think about Texas, you think everything is bigger, right? We've got UT, we've got Texas A&M. We have these really big schools that are... PWIs. And what's interesting to me is that they rely upon black folk to play football and make sure that their programs are amazing, basketball, and they're all good with that. But when it comes to making sure that they are admitting diverse students and making sure that they have their proper place or even making sure that the administration is reflective of the student body, they don't want that. They want everything else to be lily white except for those fields, and I'm tired of it. And I think that we are actually seeing a shift where we're seeing an increase in HBCU enrollment because it seems like that's the only place that black folk can go and actually be welcomed. This, again, is not what America is supposed to be. And for those that feel as if, you know, the parties are the same, because I hear it all the time, they say, well, there's no difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. There's a huge difference. Now, what people don't realize is that I can't do anything by myself, Jasmine Felicia Crockett. I need an entire team. And so when you're going out and you're voting, you have to vote on every single level. You have to look at who's running for governor of your state because they can have this type of effect. You have to look at the fact that the president has the ability to put people on the Supreme Court, such as a bunch of the races that we got on the Supreme Court now that decided affirmative action is something that we don't need. And for those that don't understand what affirmative action was ever supposed to be about, what it was is saying, you know what? You are ignoring certain talent. We want to make sure that you're forced to look at that talent. And if that talent measures up, then give that talent an opportunity. That is what we are fighting for in this country. So while we may not always get to the goal because we have to have amazing partners and we've got to have an amazing team, just know that there is only one side that is fighting for equity across the board, whether you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, we are the ones that are making this fight. No. I'll yes. get to you, mm -hmm. Maxine, in just a moment because you've been fighting this for a long time. But I'm curious if you could tell me, please, what do you say to those, and we should add that there are African Americans who are echoing this now, that maybe we shouldn't fight for DNI while well intended 50 years ago, it's outlived its purpose? <laughs> well, I think that's absurd. And, and I'm glad you're going to, uh, Maxine, to be the anchor because. Here's what I know for a fact. Maxine Waters, like many of us, have been fighting this, but she had the courage to bring it to the Congress and demand, as the chair of the financial services, one of the most prestigious committees there, to put DE&I in as a real committee with constitutional and correct and congressional rights, and I benefited by being the chair of that subcommittee. When we took on financial institutions with $50 billion or more, they all came, the CEOs. And we were able to move the needle because the data reported back to us, folks that looked like us, mm -hmm. we weren't in the C-suites. We weren't and still aren't chairman of the board. We weren't in the highest ranking positions. Then here's what they did. They created DE&I positions. Some of those positions were so low that when we brought in CEOs and asked them about it, they didn't even know the position existed mm -hmm. until they felt the wrath of Maxine Waters. <laughs> and then we continued to move the needle. We want to be on the same playing field. And we're seeing that through this administration. The very first thing that President Biden did was 
an executive order reestablishing DEI to, to remind those black folks and others who think Trump has done so much, he took all that away. Yep. Whether it was military, whether it was in education, and now they're doing it in medical schools. They're doing it, they're taking away what we can read if it's about black folks because they are afraid. Utah have outlawed diversity and inclusion in the entire state in every agency. Yeah. And just did it recently. That's yes. right. They just did that recently. And we know uh, that we have fought these battles <clears throat> in the past, and we've got to keep fighting them. One thing, black mothers and fathers have said to their children, generation after generation, go to school, get educated. Oftentimes they would say, I couldn't go, but I'm going to do everything that I can, and we're not uh, going to take a back seat. It's so important for us to fight for education because when we do that, we can aspire to careers that will help change what goes on in this country and have a real democracy. I want to give you an example of it. Right now, <clears throat> as Trump is on trial, you have Letitia James in New York, mm -hmm. you have uh, Fannie you. Willis in Georgia, and you have Tanya Chunkin, who is a judge, who all have a role to play now, prosecutors and judges. And if we're ever to change the criminal justice system and get some justice, we've got to be in there. We've got to be educated. And that's why we're not going to give up, because now we see what it means. Let me just tell you a little something that I tweeted, and that's this. When they go low, black women are going to law school. All when right. they go low, black men are becoming judges. When they go low, we're not giving up. We're going to continue and fight for education, no matter what they do, no matter how they try and stop us, and we're going to make sure that we are a part of saving democracy. Now they're saying, unbelievably, that they want to get rid of democracy, that they don't belong in the con <laughs> uh, We don't have a, a constitution that we should adhere to. And I want to tell you, they're ignorant enough to believe that. Yeah. And Trump supports that kind of talk. He supports that kind of fellowship. But when they talk about blacks voting for Trump, they can put that out there. They can have all the ads that they want to. It's not going to happen. Right. Black people are not going to vote for Trump. There may be a few misguided ones, but for the most part, the majority of black people know that Trump is a racist. They know that he's a dishonorable That's human true. being. They know that he does not like black people, the way he attacked John Lewis, the way that he attacked me, the way that he attacked other black women. He has talked about not only Africa being holes and Haiti, etc. You think black people are going to vote? All we've got to do is get them to the polls, there and that's what we're going to do. All right, we'll Getting take a break here. <laughs> it took three segments, but we got it. We'll be back <laughs> with gun violence. Back in a moment. Officers located five victims suffering from apparent gunshot wounds on the scene. Community leaders are burdened by the gun violence in this city. They say oftentimes the guns are in the hands of the youth. If anybody wants to get a gun, they go get a gun. There's not much stopping you, right? There was a summer I had where it was more parties getting shot up that weren't. We're broken, and we want this to stop. We want gun violence to stop. Welcome back to the BET News special, What's at Stake? The election, 2024. The statistics say that last year America experienced a historic low murder rate and levels of violent crime also decreased. But for too many black Americans, the persistent threat of crime and gun violence is real. We seem to have a conversation about this year after year after year. And while those statistics are true, it is evident that we have a problem, particularly in the African-American community with gun violence. You take a look at Chicago any given weekend, and the vast majority of those shootings are amongst us within our communities. Uh, Congresswoman Crockett, let me start with you. What has to be done? People are dying. 
No, I, I get it. And, and I do want to be clear. My granny actually was on the south side of Chicago uh, when I was a little kid. And actually, I experienced the only drive-by shooting I've ever experienced in my life at the age of six. But I do want to be clear that this is not a new issue that is happening. As a former criminal defense attorney, I can also tell you that we have to make sure, again, that we pay attention at every single level because this isn't necessarily something that the president does except for when it comes to determining who can have guns in this country. And the thing is, the Democrats have been pushing to make sure that we could have gun control of some sort. The Republicans are the ones that push back and they hide behind the Constitution. Their misinterpretation of the Constitution is what they hide behind. And it's interesting because it seems like the only amendment that they have ever heard of is the Second Amendment, and they get it wrong just like they get so many other things wrong. But if you want to make sure that that your local elected officials or your um, police chief have the tools that they need to make sure that they're keeping your community safe, then you need to elect Democrats on the federal level who will make sure that we put in the safeguards that are going to make sure that there are background checks, make sure that the red flag laws exist, make sure that these automatic weapons are getting off of our streets. While we talk about states' rights all the time, Congresswoman Beatty, um, as Congresswoman Crockett suggested, this really is more a state's issue than a federal issue in terms of the sheer right. sure. numbers of, uh, of violent acts. Yet, um, you have to sometimes look to the federal government to Absolutely. help push these Absolutely. things. Absolutely. And, and I agree 100 percent. And we've done that at the federal level. And it all goes back again to elections and voting. We have put more legislation forward on removing guns from communities, the red flags, looking at when people can go to a gun show and in two minutes buy an assault weapon. So we have proposed legislation. People have taken it back to some of the states, but we have open carry. We have people who can walk down the street with uh, a a rifle or a gun that's more powerful than our local police in many cases. So I think you can't legislate away people from killing one another, but we certainly could do a better job if those who are in charge, Republicans, would introduce and get the legislation that we've introduced past the House, past the Senate, because President Biden would sign it. He has been going across this country with Vice President Harris, who's come into black communities and talked about how we must stop the violence, violence against women, violence against one another, the crimes that are happening. But it takes more than just doing them. Yeah. And so often we blame us. We always look to us. Then let's look to these Republicans that are creating the laws. Yep. Because when people are being killed, they're not Democrats or Republicans. Yep. And so I put that blood on their hands because we could do better. Let me tell you, oftentimes when we talk about guns and gun control, it is because of the mass murders mm -hmm. that take place. In our communities... It's about some other things. Mm -hmm. It's about young people, mostly, who are responsible for gun violence. It's about gangs. It's about territories. We have to create more opportunities for young people. We've got to create more jobs. Is. We've got to make education more responsive. It takes resources. And so we've got to be willing to invest our time and our energy and be creative. Nobody can create better for us than we can create what is needed in these communities. And I want to tell you, I'm not willing uh, to throw away uh, the opportunities that we are afforded to use our influence. I'm not willing to lock everybody up and throw the key away. But what I'm willing to do is to keep trying to get more resources, to keep got, trying to get education more responsive, and to change some of the ways that things are done now to meet the needs of these young people, create jobs and give them the support. We know that you can create change with attention and with opportunity. And, and, and that's just, what we've very, got very to do. Let me say this quickly, because you mentioned Chicago several yes. times. Congresswoman Robin Kelly pointed out yes. that point, that we stand up and pray for the massive shootings. 
deservingly so. But we don't do it for the one-on-one -on -one mm. and the black. So it's more than just attention to the mass shooting. That's right. And we should say uh, headway can be made. In my hometown of Detroit, there has been a tremendous decrease mm -hmm. um, in violent crime and the like. All right, we'll take a break here. When we return, we'll tell you why you can be the biggest difference in this election. Back in a moment. Welcome back to our BET News special, What's at Stake, the 2024 election. I'm here with Representatives Maxine Waters, Joyce Beatty, and Jasmine Crockett. Ladies, I want to play some clips for you, if you will, from voters we recently spoke with. We've got Trump and Biden again. We've got these two men in their 70s who don't care about any of us, who are going to have the same argument they had four years ago. I'm not enamored with either candidate. Uh, so I'm going to vote. I'm going to hold my nose as I do it. I'll be honest, like, I don't feel either of them really represent what I'm looking for. But I, I feel like there's not, like, an extreme difference between the Republican and Democratic parties. As everyone knows, it's the same presidencies. I definitely feel like there should be a change. That's real. That is a sentiment out there. And not just a small minority. There are people who feel that way. I know. And uh, what... I kind of heard was, I'm exhausted, I'm just tired. People need to be inspired. They need to believe that somebody cares about them. And what we don't do is talk enough about how we legislate and what it means to have a child tax credit. A child tax credit put food on the table for families with three, four, five, six, seven children, each one getting anywhere from $250 to $300 per month. But that is not always connected to what we do. And so we've got to do a better job of helping people to understand what government is all about and what bills that are created and signed into law have a direct impact on their lives. And then we need inspiration. We need people who know how to talk to our folks. And let me tell you, we need our pastors and our ministers involved, preaching, talking, inspiring, giving hope, uplifting. And that's what the Civil Rights Movement was all about. Not only the marching, but it was about the praying. It was about inspiring young people to be involved like John Lewis got involved. So I know, and I get that, and I, it saddens me uh, to hear that kind of disappointment, that kind of disengagement. Uh, but what we've got to do with the president, who means well and who's doing everything that he can, we got to hit the streets. Mm -hmm. We've got to travel around this country yeah. and we've got to share information and let people know what we're doing. We've got to inspire and motivate. Congresswoman Beatty, let me ask you, in relation to the disenchantment we see, it's not just with young people. As disheartening as this reality is, I still have hope. I have hope because this is the most consequential election we'll have in our lifetime. And I think Maxine is right. We, we need more energy and excitement. And that's where the Congressional Black Caucus is coming in. We're going out into those districts. I've been to South Carolina. I've been to Chicago, Detroit, Virginia, for the president as a surrogate. And so we have to go back, what I like to call old school and new school. We have to go out and be in the streets. They have to see us, feel us. They have to know that we have a vice president who went to an HBCU, a vice president who is out there on this circuit and looks like them. We have Katanji Brown Jackson because in part of the Congressional Black Caucus, because of this president making a commitment before he was even elected, right. that he would put a black woman on the Supreme Court and a female would be his vice president. Who does that before they're elected and ran on that and he is delivered? So say he's too old, but it's about what you're able to deliver. You can have someone that might be much younger and ineffective. And I say to everyone, every vote counts. No one who has fought harder than the three of us sitting here in our caucus for Social Security, mm. for Medicare, and for Medicaid. We have been able to sustain that. So I, I think it's giving them the sound bites. 
You have a roof over your head because President Biden in this caucus has fought for you. Tuition reimbursement for those who are in school, those who are trying to go to college, Pell Grants, putting more money into HBCUs. Yeah. All of that That's has right. happened That's right. because of this administration. That's right. And so I just tell them, like John Lewis, if you see something, say something. And Ed, today we're saying something. <laughs> get yourselves out there <laughs> and get registered to vote and vote. Listen, I think, I think that what we've talked about is that the Democrats have not been very good at connecting the dots on what it is that we have done to actually make for positive change. And so because they haven't done that, while the Republicans are good at taking credit for stuff that they ain't have nothing to do with, this administration has decided that, number one, we believe in history and we believe in correcting the wrongs of that history, but it doesn't happen overnight. You get the legislation and then it still takes some time before you see what happens. Flint, Everybody knows about Flint, Michigan, but the reality is that there is a Flint, Michigan in every single mm -hmm. black community you that go. you look at, mm -hmm. whether we're talking about mm -hmm. the air, the, the soil, water, or the, the water. Mm -hmm. But I have delivered mm -hmm. millions of dollars directly to my mm -hmm. district to make sure that we can clean up the dumping grounds that have been the areas that we live in. But the problem is the people don't know. They don't know about the $7 billion that has been invested in HBCUs versus the $253 million that was only a reauthorization under Trump, who did not want to do it until That's a member right. of the Black Caucus right. made sure that she That's pushed right. and said, no, this is going to get done. They don't recognize that there's been over $153 billion of student loan debt that has been relieved that has affected over 4 million people thus far. Yeah, yeah. So, right. I get that those aren't the cute little headlines. That's not what goes viral, but we are doing the work every single day. And so, yes, we have to do our part to tell our stories, but honestly, what we need the people to do is recognize that they own this vote as well. It's not just a privilege that you get to sit on your hands for. You have to do the research and find out, is my elected official doing the things to help better my life? Well, there's some excitement for you. There it is. All right. Thank you all. Well, okay. Greatly appreciate it. Only a few months to really light that fire, and we hope that, uh, in fact, no matter who you vote for, you get out there and uh, do your civic duty. For all of us here at BET News, I'm Ed Gordon. Thanks for joining us. Good night.